Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. You know, God's most important place on the planet is Israel. He calls it the apple of his eye. In Israel, the most important place is Jerusalem, mentioned 750 times in the Bible. And in Jerusalem, sandwiched between the taller mountains of Mount Zion and Mount of Olives is God's most important piece of land, Mount Moriah. This is where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, where the first and second temple stood, where all the biblically commanded blood sacrifices were performed, even where Jesus shed his blood for our sin. And in the future, Jesus will rule the earth from Mount Moriah for a thousand years. So where the temple stood on Mount Moriah, where the future Jewish temple will be rebuilt, and where Jesus will sit on his throne is hugely important to God. To the Jewish archaeologists, there's no debate. Enjoy this presentation, The Location of the Second Temple by Randall Price. All right, nothing like a good controversy to start the afternoon, huh? All right. Well, um, let's start with a, a little story. There was a Jewish man and another man, and they were talking about the whole issue of the land of Israel. And uh, one man said, why do you Jews have to go back to Israel? I mean, it's a controversial place, after all. Won't another country do? The Jewish man replied, where do you go to visit your grandmother? Well, this guy said, well, Lebanon, why? He said, well, why go way over there? There are plenty of old women here that are nice. <laughs> I hope that uh, communicated, because... God chose a people, and he chose a place for that people. And he chose a program for that people in that place. And they're irreplaceable because of that. And so these things go together. There's a relationship with God. That relationship is mediated through the Jewish people to the rest of the families of the earth. And it's extremely important what God chose and why he did it. So if the location of Israel is important, how much more the location God chose to dwell forever. And if you doubt that's the case, Psalms 132. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. And we don't have anything that says God removed his presence from there. All right, yes, the Shekinah glory went away. Yes, the temple was were destroyed. But he has chosen it, and he says it's forever. And so in some sense, God's purpose is the same. It has not changed. Now, when we come to talk about this place, notice Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. It says, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Now, we start our Christian history in the book of Acts chapter 1, Verses 6 and 7, we have this statement by the disciples then to Jesus after his 40 days on earth, teaching about the kingdom of God. And their first question is, Lord, is it this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because for them, the restoration of the kingdom to Israel was the kingdom, not the church, not some social program that we're going to somehow change the world through what we can do. This was God's program. And then he said, you be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. So the word went forth from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. When we come to the end of the age, it comes right back to where it started, Jerusalem, and to the Temple Mount, which will be raised and exalted above all the other hills. That tells me this is an important place. And just like Bill said, Mount of Olives is important. Jesus is going to return there. But after he returns there, he's going to set up shop. He's going to rule from a throne on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And so it becomes immensely important where this is. Now, Jeremiah 3.17 says, at that time they'll call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. All the nations will be gathered to it for the name of the Lord, nor should they walk anymore in the stubbornness of their evil heart. So obviously this change can only happen when other changes have happened. And so when we have all Israel being saved, and then we have what's called the judgment of the nations, Matthew 25, where he separates the sheep from the goat nations. We start the millennial kingdom with all believers, no longer stubborn evil hearts among the nations nor among Israel. So all of them begin, and when they begin, they begin here. 
where the throne of the Lord is, because that's what we're going to appear before and uh, worship Him. That brings us back to the controversy. Not a controversy as you might think over Jew or Arab fighting over this sacred spot, but where the spot is that's sacred. That's the problem. And it's, by the way, only a controversy within evangelicalism because of certain ideas that have come forth and uh, have become popular. So the question is, where did the ancient temples stand? Now, as I said, these popular theories began back in 1999 with a book by a man named Ernest Martin. He was uh, with Ambassador College. Uh, that's Henry w. Ar- w. Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God. Uh, he was a teacher in that school. He worked for a time with Benjamin Mazar at the Temple Mount excavations that began right after 1967 and ended about 1978. And he originated a theory. I don't think anyone had come with this idea prior to him. But he says, now is the time to remove profound ignorance and forgetfulness, what we now know from these new archaeological and biblical discoveries. And this must be the ones he's referring to that he was a part of. He says, though the whole world over the past generations has forgotten where the original temple of Solomon was constructed, we are now assured the temples of Solomon, Zerubbabel and Herod, were built just above the once fresh and pure waters of the Gihon Spring, located on the southeast of Jerusalem. So his theory was this. The Temple Mount uh, that you saw in some of the previous slides is not the Temple Mount. In fact, from his point of view, the temple was located in the city of David above the Gihon Spring. And then the 35-acre platform we call the Temple Mount was, in fact, the Antonia Fortress, where uh, there were Jewish forces stationed and Roman forces, and, uh, which was also part of the destruction that happened in AD 70. So this is the way he would reconstruct things. Now, more recently, uh, another popular writer uh, took Ernest Martin's views, which, by the way, had been answered by many, many people, written in many, many articles, uh, and so it, there was a silence for a time, but uh, this was uh, brought back by uh, Robert Cornuke, and, he's, and, and what is interesting is the way this book was uh, presented. It basically says, amazing new discoveries that change everything about the location of Solomon's temple. But it didn't stop there. So this book is being heralded as an investigative masterpiece with astounding archaeological and prophetic implications, sending shockwaves through the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian worlds. Can you imagine the upheaval in political and religious thinking if the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is not the site of Solomon's and Herod's temple? If the stones of the Wailing Wall are not what tradition says? This is a must read for anyone who wants to fit together the biblical records, geo politics, that is current geopolitics, and prophecy. Now, uh, so the claim being made is this is really an arresting book that is changing everything. Um, So coming to this, by the way, other books and other videos all produced uh, as well on this topic by other writers. So why should this matter? Who cares where the temple was located? What difference can it make, as Hillary once said? All right, so... Um, the truth first cannot be advanced by error. It's a fundamental principle. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Uh, the scripture says in 1 John 2.21, I have not written, I have written to you because you know the truth, but because you do know it, because no lies of the truth. So foundationally, we are responsible for getting to the truth of things. Don't believe the first thing you hear. You have to examine these things to see if they're so. That, that's what a Berean does. And then we have other passages in Timothy that say, the goal of our instruction is from a pure heart and a good conscience, a sincere faith. And he says the time will come when there, those will not endure sound doctrine, as our first message this morning on the chaos of the church explained. People will want to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, turn people's ears away from truth, and turn aside to myths. And a myth is something that does not have a real substance to it. It may have had a historical core, but has been warped and changed and transformed from history to legend to myth. Uh, and, and so, and in many cases, it never had a foundation. And that's Jewish myths in particular, Agadah, the things that are just stories about principles, but never uh, real truths. Uh, David Lazarus in Israel Today uh, News said this recently, 
As happens in some Christian circles, particularly concerning Israel, the theory was based on incomplete information and false assumptions that spread too far and caused too much confusion. Some Christians are getting very excited about the idea that Jews could build the temple in the city of David, believing that doing so will hasten the day of Messiah's return. But fake news and debunked theories will not bring the true king of Israel or his kingdom to Israel. Now, second thing is, why should this matter? Well, because believers are responsible to critique other believers. And this is where we have a real problem, because in the church, we tend to think we should not disagree with anybody about anything. Uh, we're nice. We, we, we don't try to question whether someone's right or wrong. We simply accept it, and we don't want to argue. Uh, but the Scripture tells us, what, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? I mean, Paul says, from your own midst will come ravenous wolves seeking to devour the flock. Somebody's going to have to, you know, oppose somebody at some time within the church. Or you're going to lose the church. We, we have to be men and women of courage and conviction. And then, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. That means there's some things that are not good, and we have to root that out and be discerning. That's an important thing for all of us. Uh, sensationalist claims also adversely affect the unity of the body of Christ. I don't know if you realize that, but we, we get into these conferences, um, the prophecy circuit, as it were, and there are a lot of things we like to talk about, especially current events. We're examining to see where they may go, uh, different trends, different proposals. That's okay. We can talk about all those things. But all of a sudden, someone says, now listen, you know, I'm following this guy, and he says this, and you don't say what he says. Mm. And all of a sudden, we divide over these type of things, which, frankly, are peripheral. Uh, they're not necessarily essential, but sometimes they can be essential. But it, these things divide. They cause confusion among believers. And Proverbs says, God hates those who sow discord among brothers. They, there's skepticism toward Jewish history and tradition. This is one of the key terms that people say. They say, you know, uh, this is all tradition. The, the Jews had a tradition. People had a tradition. The Byzantines had a tradition. And tradition is simply wrong. We go with history. Well, there's something called historical tradition. If you didn't know what that is, it simply means this is history that has been uh, made into a clear understanding or teaching and is perpetuated uh, as an accepted fact. Um, in Corinthians, we have uh, maintain the traditions as I delivered them to you. In 2 Thessalonians, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, either by spoken word or by letter. Uh, this is not myths or uh, teachings that are, are not based on Scripture. These are Scriptures that have become something that are now a tradition received by the church and passed on. They have a foundation. They have a substance. Um, and this also can result in biblical truth being sidelined. Because it says certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion. Listen, there's enough problems with the fundamentals in the church today to be arguing over peripheral things, uh, which people get into. Uh, and I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss those things and examine those things, but they shouldn't be something to divide us. And this shouldn't either, but it can be. Now, I have a biblical museum. I'm curator of this at Liberty University. Uh, we have like 3,000 artifacts. I bring people in to see all these things, which are evidence for the faith. And I can tell you, almost on a weekly basis, someone comes in and says, did you know that the temples were never on the Temple Mount? They were in the city of David. And they never say, what do you think about? They always say, did you know? Because they become utterly convinced. And many of these are pastors. Someone has handed them one of these books, and the pastor, not equipped in archaeology or in necessarily historical studies, uh, says, I don't know what to, to do with it, uh, and reading it uh, seems quite persuasive. And so this is the, and I know how this, and, and if I in any way give my view, then they begin to question me because they become so convinced. And we need to try to do this in a dispassionate way as much as possible because I'm, I'm an academic. I come from the viewpoint of peer review. If I write something, hey, go for it. Anybody out there can examine it. Tell me what they think about it. You know, I don't feel like I'm being personally attacked. It's not the man that's being attacked.
habitat. It's the message. And the message may or may not be right, and I may be corrected. Why, why should I not want that? Uh, we do that before we actually publish on a, uh, you know, a global scale because we want to get all the, the problems out of the way. But others don't. They just go, and then when people begin to question them, uh, they believe it's an ad hominem attack. They call that a, you know attack against the man. I've never done that that I know of. I respect the people who write, but I can also uh, respect that they are wrong. And these are things that I, I need to explain. Now, fourth reason why this should matter is there are serious religious and political implications or ramifications for those that hold this view. Uh, this view argues that the prophecy of rebuilding the temple could be fulfilled today on the basis that the site has no competing structures and is under Jewish control. Martin and others wanted to see a temple rebuilt in a place that could not conflict with the Muslims. So this was the idea, oh, we can do this now. Wouldn't that be great? But there is no place that doesn't conflict with the Muslims, frankly, unless you pick another country. Because the Silwan village, where the city of David is, is one of the most conflicted places I know of. When Jews have tried to settle there, or they've been building things connected with the city of David uh, archaeological site, uh, there's been immense controversy and, shall we say, even violence as a result. So to think that you could build there really is no different than trying to build on the historic Temple Mount. Also, this supports Islamic revisionist history. Uh, there are the, the, the number one statement you'll hear from Muslim authorities, and this is across the board. Now, not academics. Academics will not agree with this, but they don't publicly say it because they don't want to be censured or lose their jobs. So the view is there is not the smallest indication of the existence of a Jewish temple on this place in the past, that is the Temple Mount, in the whole city of Jerusalem, not a single stone indicating Jewish history. That's a quote from Sheikh Ikrama Sabri, who was uh, a mufti ago. And uh, this is the official revisionist position of the Palestinian Authority, as well as most of the Islamic world. Uh, and, and so they basically say there were no Jews in Israel until the 1800s. And this is never, so this is totally revisionist. But this kind of viewpoint plays right into their hands. They have used it in their own political propaganda, saying, see, even the Christians now agree with this. There was no ever, never a temple here. So it's important to get these facts right. So let me walk, I have 10 points to walk through. First, the location of the temples were never lost to Judaism. This is one of the claims that is made the Jews forgot. Remember Walter Martin's, I mean, Ernest Martin's, I love Walter Martin, sorry, Ernest Martin's book, was the two temples that Jerusalem forgot. So the claim is the Jews just lost this. But the fact is there's an unbroken chain of Jewish testimony that has uniformly maintained the site of the temples is on the historic Temple Mount. Let's go back uh, to the Mishnah Torah. Maimonides in the medieval period said that once the site for the temple was fixed in the days of Samuel and King David, it could not be changed. The reason for that is the Shekinah glory came and filled a certain spot and it left that spot and then it's going to return to that spot. That's what Ezekiel chapters 9 through 11 explain. And in chapter 43, it has the Shekinah return. And so it comes exactly back to the, from the place and to the place uh, that it originally was in. Now, after the Babylon exile, you can read in Ezra that Cyrus said, take these vessels and go put them in the temple which is in Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt on its original site. So the first temple had been destroyed. Now a second temple is going to be rebuilt by Zerubbabel, and he says, go do it on its original site. And they laid the foundations of the house of God in Jerusalem. So they had to know where it was in order to rebuild it. And remember, while there are Jews that went into exile, there were also Jews that stayed behind. Not all left. And then uh, there was an article done uh, by Lowenberg, who is an historian, and this is what he says. He says, contrary to what many believe, Jews did not abandon the Temple Mount after the temple's actual destruction in A.D. 70. This is, this is the second temple now. He says, there's even evidence that sacrifices continued for some time on a surviving altar. It was only after the Bar Kokhba revolt, and this is, you know, 70 years or so later, that Jews were barred from the site and from Jerusalem by the victorious and vindictive Emperor Hadrian. He goes on to say, Christians seem to have forgotten the Temple Mount as evidenced by the failure of the pilgrim Egyra to mention it on her visit to Jerusalem. Uh, that's in the 4th century. And its absence on the Madaba map, which is the oldest 
mosaic map of the Holy Land, which is the map of Jordan today. But the Temple Mount is actually, the, the mosaics are m- missing from that. But nevertheless, there was nothing there at the time. However, it was actually a deliberate avoidance of the site for theological reasons. Jews, on the other hand, never forgot the Temple Mount, even when none of the original temple buildings remained standing. Wherever they lived, they faced Jerusalem three times a day and prayed for the restoration of the temple and the renewal of the sacrificial system. This is called the Amidah, and there's 14 benedictions, and one of those calls for the rebuilding of the temple speedily in our day. And they have to turn toward and pray this prayer. If you don't know where you're Facing in prayer, in 1 Kings 8, tells you you're supposed to face toward this place, uh, then what do you do? But Jews did. They never had a problem with this. Furthermore, there are indications that uh, despite imperial bans, some Jews continued to pray on the Temple Mount. He goes on to say, the late 4th century sage Rabbi Bibi offered instructions to those who went to the Temple Mount to ensure their behavior would not degrade the holiness of this place, as some do today. They say you cannot wear leather shoes, can't inadvertently walk on the air. We think where the Holy of Holies is. These same instructions continue. A 6th century Agadic work, a Midrash Sir Sharim Rabbah, includes instruction for Jews everywhere to face in the direction of the Temple Mount when praying, adding that those who pray on the Temple Mount should turn to the Holy of Holies, an injunction that only makes sense if the ban is not strictly enforced. Now, so Jews did not, could not, forget where their temples were. But not only did the Jews not forget the site of their temple, their enemies did not forget that either. The actions of enemies against the temple mount to punish the Jews throughout the centuries show that they understood where the historic site was. Uh, For instance, when Emperor Hadrian banned the Jews from uh, going into Jerusalem, uh, he plowed the temple mount under with salt Tinius Rufus, his general, did that. It's clearly in the sources. They had to know where that was. Then they banned Jews from entering Jerusalem because this was after the second Jewish revolt. They didn't want another Jewish revolt on the grounds that the Jews wanted to restore the temple, so they banned them from even getting into the city. But all the way through the Turkish period, Jews on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av, when they commemorate the destruction of the temple, would go to the Mount of Olives, and they would look over the historic ruins of the temple and they would pray. Now, they didn't go down to David's city to do that. It's recorded where they were. They knew where it was then, and the enemies did too. That's why they banned them from coming into the city. The Temple Mount was also turned into a city dump. This was done in the Byzantine period. Here's a statement of uh, Emperor Constantine. As you know, uh, 325 is the date of Nicaea. Uh, Just before that, the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and he made Christianity the religion of state. And so the Jews uh, were kind of dispossessed at this point. And so Constantine said to Eusebius, who was the bishop of Caesarea, said this at the Council of Nicaea, let us then have nothing in common with the testable Jewish crowd we have received from our Savior a different way. And this was over the debate as whether uh, Easter, the Christian celebration of Easter, should be on the Jewish Passover because they occurred at the same time. So they separated them because they wanted nothing to do with the Jews. And his mother, Constantine's mother, Helena, uh, said the Byzantines wanted to turn the site of the temple into a trash dump in order to fulfill the words of the New Testament, that not one stone will be left standing, or Jesus condemned the temple, your house is being left to you desolate, these kind of statements. And so today when you go to the site, you enter through a gate called the Dung Gate. And the reason for that is because they would carry the refuse of the city, they would dump it right there on the desolate Temple Mount. And there was a street called the Eastern Cardinal that went beside it. I excavated part of that. I know right where that is. We found things, an archive with temple-related uh, statements in it uh, from the 7th century B.C. there. Um, nevertheless, this is what was there. And it wasn't until we come to the Islamic period that this becomes a place where they clear it from refuse and build uh, competing structures. But they did this because they knew where it was, and they were punishing the Jews. Now, which is more plausible, that Helena, the mother of the Roman emperor, would have supported turning the site of a former Roman fortress into a city dump, or that she would have done this to the former site of the Jewish temple? So if, you, if your view is this was the place of the Roman fortress in the past, why would this even been an issue? 
why wouldn't you dump your dump into the city of David where the temples were? Well, then you have to go back to everybody forgot. But they didn't forget. And history affirms that. Here's another uh, point. Um, in 363 B.C., we had the Roman Emperor Julian. He's called Julian the Apostate. He wanted to basically uh, find a way to restore sacrifices. He was pagan, not Christian, but he was over a Christian empire. And he decided that the, the Jews, because they used to offer sacrifices, were the closest thing to paganism he had around. So he offered the Jews the opportunity to rebuild the temple. And Jews were coming back. And one of those that came back um, wrote right here on this southern part of the western wall an inscription. And it tells us this was part of their hope in the redemption of the Messianic age. We have from the very beginning Jews in the diaspora, that is those outside the land, writing letters back and forth to Jews inside the land. We have some of those preserved. We know this Messianic hope was still alive. And so someone came back to Jerusalem under Julian's invitation to say, this may be the, the age. And there's an inscription here, and the inscription reads in Hebrew from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 14. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice, and your bones will flourish like the grass. So this inscription that's there, okay, was very important because it attests to the fact that someone believed that not only could the temple be rebuilt, this was the Messianic era starting, but this was the very place from which it would start when the temple was rebuilt. So as Amir ben Dub was one of the co-directors of the excavation in this era, he says, this most likely reflects an excited hope of a third century Jew returning to Jerusalem at a time when the Roman emperor offer the Jewish people an opportunity to rebuild the temple. Okay, so they had to, you, why didn't they go to the city of David and write the inscription there? Because they had nothing in the city of David. This is where they believed it was. Now, we know when the Caliph Omar came to the site in the, let's say, the 7th century A.D., uh, he was led by the Christian priest Sophronis to the site where he was looking for what he called the, the place where David had built his temple. He was a little confused. Uh, it was Solomon who built it, but nevertheless, they considered David and Solomon, uh, at least later in Islam, as uh, prophets of Islam. So he was looking for this. And he was led to this rock that was under the dung uh, at the desolate place of the Temple Mount. He started to cover it with his own hands, and his followers jumped in aghast of this guy would touch it with their own hands, and they removed all the filth. And this became the rock in the year 691, which the Dome of the Rock was built to cover. This was done by the Caliph Abdelmalik bin Juan, and he did this uh, for political reasons, but also to mark the site of the ancient temple. That's why it was built. It was a shrine, not a mosque. It's a shrine. And they called it Bayat al-Maqdis, which is Arabic for the exact same phrase in Jewish sources, Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. Okay? Um, and you'll see throughout the Islamic records of this period, that's what it's called. It's related to the temple. Uh, we even have inscriptions. It's still in Israel in older uh, Islamic mosques that have that phrase that's there. These facts serve to confirm the fact the Holy Temple was and is the real location of the first and second temples, as one man has said. But beyond that, we have back in the year 660 A.D., an Armenian uh, named Sebios who writes, I relate a little more about the intentions of the rebellious Jews. Having earlier received help from leaders of the children of Hagar, that would be the Muslims or the Arabs, conceived a plan to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. Having discovered the place, which is called the Holy of Holies, they then built on its foundations a place of prayer for themselves. However, the Ishmaelites, jealous of them, drove them from this place and called it their house of prayer. So what, what place would that be? What would be the place the Muslims made their house of prayer? The Dome of the Rock. All right. So they're saying before that the Jews knew that was the place. The Muslims knew the Jews knew that was the place. And so they built their place there, and there it still is. Now, a third reason why the temple was at the historic location, is that a correct understanding of the location of a threshing floor. In history and scripture corrects these authors' basic error that the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite could have been in the city of David. I'll explain. The city of, it would have been in a lower location 
within the city of David itself. And what we know, uh, clearly from 2 Chronicles 3.1, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. And the Lord appeared to his father David at the place David had prepared on Mount Moriah. And there was a threshing floor on Mount Moriah or in the Jebusite. That, these, these connections are clear. Uh, so where was that threshing floor? It tells us that it was built there, and, and so David was there. So where do you find threshing floors in the ancient world? Uh, I'm citing those who are experts on this. The, this is all from a, a publication on identifying threshing floors in the archaeological record. And it says, in ancient Israel, threshing floors were located on hard substrates such as bare rocks. These were often situated on rock shelves or in fertile soil. Threshing floors could also be located outside of the perimeter of a village on high ground or take advantage of open air and wind that is necessary for winnowing. The only place you really can get a kind of airflow, and you don't want the chaff to fall into any water sources because that would pollute the water sources. So if this is at the Gihon Spring, that's a real issue. So you read also in the scriptures over and over again. It, it talks about, it says, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Where is David? He is in his palace in the city of David. If he's going up from there, where is he going? He's going up to a high place where you could have a threshing floor. That's where it would be. So it would have been situated on a level area of Mount Moriah, rather than a downslope near the Gihon Spring. Now, it tells us too, in 2 Chronicles 8, 11, that Solomon brought the Ark of the Covenant up from the city of David, where David had placed it in his palace. It says, here's the reason. My wife, an Egyptian wife, shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy where the Ark has entered. So her presence uh, as a pagan and a Gentile would defile the Ark. And so she, it, it could not stay in David's city. It had to be somewhere else, okay? His wife was going to dwell in the palace, so it, that's where the ark was. So the ark had to move if she was going to dwell there, and that's what happened. It says, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem. They might bring the ark of the covenant up from the city of David, which is Zion. So it goes up from there to the place of the threshing floor where God had told David to build an altar, and that becomes the place of the temple. Now, a fourth per reason. David's city is inadequate for the placement of the original temple platform of the first temple and the expanded platform of the second temple. We know that the original temple mount, Solomon's original temple mount, was 500 cubits. That's 861 square feet. Uh, that is clear. The, uh, Josephus tells us that in his book called Antiquities of the Jews. Um, and whatever location one argues for for the temple, it must accommodate a platform at least this size. Although, as you can see from the picture, it's much larger. The reason for that is Solomon's original temple was this. But we had additions in the Hasmonean period and the Herodian period, which expanded that. And here, as you look at the wall, if you stand on the Mount of Olives, you look straight across. You have the Golden Gate uh, to the right of this picture. Uh, maybe the left of the picture for you or got two pictures, so right and left, okay? Um, but you have first the Hasmonean edition, which is a 200 B.C. Uh, up to 63 B.C. when the Romans conquered. And then you have Herod building an addition on here to this, uh, this uh, farther side in the south. And so we have a seam and we have a bend that indicate these additions. You can see them. Uh, here's, so here we have the city of David. And this is a topographical map. It was an ordnance survey of Jerusalem done back in the 1800s when you could do these kind of things under authority. And I've simply had placed here the, the square, the, the 861-foot square. Um, one of the authors, Mr. Cornuk, argues for a temple mount that's far too small. Uh, that's great. It would fit if that were the right size, but it's not. The actual size, you can see if you put it over the Gihon Spring, uh, would cover not only First Temple houses, but also First Temple tombs that we know are there. And it's, it's very doubtful that people would have built tombs under the temple or continued to build tombs in that place. It would also block the Kidron Valley. 
So water flow coming in would be blocked, and that would cause many problems. It, this just cannot fit in the city of David. And when you add the Herodian and Hasmonean extensions on there, it, it certainly doesn't fit, but it fits perfectly on the square that we know is the modern Temple Mount. Now, another reason, number five, archaeological evidence of a city dump in the Second Temple period in the city of David precludes a temple at this site. And I'm sure a lot of you have never heard this information and because you're not reading the professional sources. These come out in some different archaeological publications. This is relatively recent. Okay, here you see part of an archaeological dig. You see the strata. You see how it's slanted. This is all layers of accumulated debris. This is a 2,000-year-old garbage dump that was discovered only in 2013-2014 on the eastern slope of the city of David. And let me show you what it does. Okay, here you can see it runs right alongside the eastern wall. In fact, the, the Muslim cemetery is built on part of it. Uh, this is the large area. Uh, the mantle of debris covers the entire eastern slope of the southwestern hill, which is known as the City of David. The area of the debris is at least 400 meters long. It's about 1,200 feet long on the north-south axis and 50 to 70 meters, which is like, what, 150 to 210 meters or feet wide on the west-east axis. The dump was a continuous use until at least the last 100 years of the Second Temple period. Okay, so here is this area. This massive garbage dump covered, you know, what, 7 million square feet to a depth of 30 feet. The dump began at the southeast corner of the Rhodian Temple. It covered the slope that contained the city of David. In fact, they found a retaining wall built around the Gihon Spring to protect it so the garbage wouldn't overflow it. This fact, this debris covers an entire area of the city of David from the time, uh, let's say, of the uh, beginning of the Second Temple up until just before it ended. And they didn't find certain things in the debris, which indicates that it, was, it stopped about the time of the siege of Jerusalem when they didn't have the money to support the municipality to, to handle garbage dumps. And it means that there's no temple located there. There's no, there was, why would you build a temple on a garbage dump or throw garbage on top of a temple location? No one does that and where thousands of worshipers and pilgrims would come. The conclusion one can draw from this garbage dump is that if the temple indeed stood on the western slope of the Kidron Valley above the Gihon Spring, then it must have been built on an unstable landfill, which is unlikely uh, because you wouldn't have a temple if that happened, or as all large Jerusalem buildings are founded on rock, especially such a large complex as the Temple Mount and its buildings, there shouldn't be any landfill there. If the temple indeed stood above the spring, there, shouldn't be a, there should be a large hole in this landfill, but there isn't. Therefore, a theory that cannot withstand the clear archaeological evidence is itself garbage. Okay. Pardon me. I didn't, I didn't my statement. Someone else's statement. All right. Okay. Uh, six, Jesus did not say that all of the temple complex would be destroyed, but only the temple buildings. And let me explain that, because here's what people say. They say, no, there's no remains of the temple in the city of David. And the reason is, Jesus said, there's not one stone that's going to be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Don't you believe Jesus? And, of course, conversely, they will say, if all the stones are gone, what's that western wall doing there? Okay, Jesus prophesied that. Do you believe Jesus' word or, or not? Well, if that's what you're left with, you would say, well, I guess I believe Jesus, you know. But what did Jesus say? Our first responsibility is to understand the biblical text before we run off and uh, come with other theories. So notice the text says the temple, they pointed out the temple buildings to him. And he says, do you see all these things? Not one stone here should be left upon another stone that will not be torn down. Jesus is, is clearly talking about something that we need to understand. Uh, in the temple, Mr. Cornuk says, Christ's words clearly state that the entire temple, each and every stone, will be dug up, dislodged, and tossed away. That's the way he interprets this. Now, the city of David theorists have to admit that there are no traces of stones from either the first or second temples found in the excavation of the city of David. That's been going on since 1978. I was living in Israel at the time. I remember all this happened. This, however, does not trouble them because they read Jesus' words to say that not one stone would be left. But this, the text does not say no stones would not be left in existence. 
it says that not one stone be left upon another stone, indicating that only the buildings would be toppled. It is true that some stones, such as large columns of the royal stoa, were reused, some in Jerusalem's Nea church, they know this, others were taken to other lands, but the majority of the stones of the temple itself were pushed over the eastern wall of the temple, closest to the destruction site, and today are covered by two millennia of accumulated soil and an Islamic cemetery. And these could be found if excavations were possible at the site, but you cannot dig there. It's off limits, politically, religiously. Now, Bob Corning says it's interesting that there are massive stone blocks by the thousands in the wall supporting the temple platform. Was Jesus wrong in saying this? Well, not one stone would remain standing. Obviously, uh, that would be a problem if that's what Jesus referred to. But his statement here talks about the temple buildings. That's on that 35-acre platform, all the buildings that are up there but not the retaining walls that are around the building. That's the box that holds up the platform. What you don't, these, are not even, these are not considered buildings, technically. These are simply substructures that make the buildings possible. And, and they were not burned or leveled, and they remain. So there's no uh, problem with what Jesus said. It harmonizes perfectly with the archaeological information. Now, there's also abundant archaeological evidence for the site of the ancient temples at the Temple Mount and nowhere else. Okay? And this is something that troubles me as an archaeologist, that the authors of these different publications don't deal with archaeological data. They try to deal with some different things in history they, from Josephus or ancient pilgrim accounts that they can try to, to make a, a case. But the fact is that... Uh, not interacting with the very clear archaeological data is a real problem. For instance, no archaeologist, I, and I mean no archaeologist that I know, support this view. Uh, this is the unanimous verdict of Israeli archaeologists who have excavated the site since 1968. Jody Magnus uh, says, I know of no credible scholars who question the existence of the two temples or who deny they stood somewhere on the Temple Mount. And I bring up Eli Shukran because in Mr. Cornick's book, in particular, and others, they've made much of Eli Shukran's discovery of a structure in a certain part of the city of David. I've been to it many times. I've been with Eli to it many times. And I've also read Eli and uh, Ronnie Reich's official report on this, which you may not have seen, but this is not identified as Melchizedek's temple or something like this. Uh, Eli had some of those ideas early on, but Further studies showed that the triangular cuts in the rock were to support looms. They found loom weights, okay, which are related to weaving there. They found that the, the thing was not to bring blood from an altar because there was no altar there. They just hypothesized that there was one. There's rather a hole, and that was for an oil press. And they found other things. They do find a standing stone, which indicates there was some reverence for perhaps God there. But this is the basement of an Iron Age home, and these are part of the industry environment. This is the official report of the guys who excavated. And so Eli says, and you can read him right here, he says, there's no evidence that the temple of, was in the city of David. The temple known as Solomon's temple was absolutely on the Temple Mount. I have no question about that. And yet he's been cited as one who supports the other view. So I just wanted to get him on record for this, because this is what he says. Now, Dr. Martin uh, reconstructed the Temple Mount to have Antonio Fortress here. And I want to talk about some things there. Between it, he shows clearly the double and triple gates. And if you go to Israel today, uh, you can walk up uh, the steps from the ancient time up to this wall. There used to be a gate there. The gates are now blocked. You can even, by the way, uh, hopefully this summer, take what's called the Pilgrim Path. It goes all the way down from the Pool of Siloam. And you can walk that all the way up on those original steps right to this point, which indicates that those steps don't lead to the city of David. They lead to very much to the, the, uh, the southwest of it where you had the pool of Siloam and right up straight to the Temple Mount. Now, look at this. Here's the excavations done by uh, Mazar, Benjamin Mazar, originally, now followed by his granddaughter, Elot Mazar, 
uh, this in the old field, this is the area we're talking about, these steps that are here. What do we know about these? Well, we know there was a double and triple gate. There, you can still see the outlines of both gates. In between, there was Jewish mikvot, which are immersion pools. And on the day of Pentecost, when you read about thousands, 5,000 at one time, baptized, this is where that took place because they heard Peter's sermon and they, they came to faith in the Lord. And this is where they were baptized in that place. It's all still there today. And they all had to do with ritual purification. It has nothing to do. Romans don't care squat about ritual purification. This is a Jewish issue. And uh, you see these there, okay? This would be the entrance to the Antonia Fortress, if Martin were correct. But all around you see these mikvot, these immersion pools. They're right there in that area. So it's quite clear this uh, is a Jewish site, not a Roman site. All right? Uh, eight, there was an abundant source of water from Jerusalem water systems and from the Temple Mount systems. They said, you got to have the Gihon Spring, which is a gushing spring, to f give the water for the temple. Obviously, that's the one place that would have taken, taken place. But contrary to these authors, the temple sacrificial system was not dependent on the Gihon Spring at all. Here is 66,000 gallon reservoir it was used for pilgrims going to the first temple. It's right there uh, near what we call Robinson's Arch today. It's under that. Uh, here are 37 known water systems. That's all that they did in the 19th century. They were able to actually uh, plot out. And, and they were filled with rainwater. That's what they call living water. Okay, there's two sources of living water. A spring or water that comes down from heaven, okay, which has not been somehow polluted in some way. And that's what these are. This is the living water. And here in this model that was created by Conrad Schick back in the 19th century, you can see these cisterns. It's what he was able to see in that day. They're all there. Here are some of these cisterns, drawings of them, and, and a photograph of one. Two million gallons of one called the Great Sea just underneath the Temple Mount. Another one, uh, the 66,000 gallons I just mentioned, uh, is there as well. You can see cisterns in all these places. See where the Dome of the Rock is. It's quite close to that. That was what was used to cleanse the area, to take care of the sacrificial remains. All of this is there. And there's also other water sources that lead into it from places, one beneath Christ Church, which you can see which leads straight to the Temple Mount. We also know from the Babylonian Talmud, uh, Tractate Yoma, there were five immersions, uh, and the high priest immersed himself in the Etam Well, which was on the Temple Mount. He didn't go down to the city of David. He went right here. And this is quite clear that they used that there. We even found uh, mikvot right next to where the al aqsa Mosque is, or actually underneath the al aqsa Mosque. Uh, that uh, has come out in recent days, too. Now, nine archaeological evidence of the destruction of the temple and temple-related structures are from the historic Temple Mount. I mentioned Elat Mazar. Her work has been in the uh, area of the Southern Steps and the Ophel, which is the area between the Temple Mount and the City of David. She says here, 1 Kings 3, it tells us that Solomon, when he finished building his own house and the house of the Lord, the temple, and the wall around Jerusalem. Well, you can't find things from the temple directly, but she found this wall that's connected to them, and here it is. You can go tour that today. You just have to keep going further down from the southern steps until you get to this wall, and there that is, among other things. Uh, we found also the Sorag inscription. You see here in this picture that um, Jews could go beyond the court of the women into the court of the men, the court of Israel, and there they could, uh, could come. They couldn't go into the court of the priest if they were not priests, so there's certain limitations. But Gentiles couldn't even go to the court of the women. They had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. And so between the court of the Gentiles and the, and the court of the women, there was this warning sign uh, written in Greek that said, don't come past here. In fact, here's the stone, okay? And you can see, if you read Greek, the last words, thanaton, down there, which means death. And it basically said, don't go past this point unless you want to die. You're going to be responsible for that. And Paul, if you remember, was arrested and accused of taking Trophimus beyond this point because they saw Paul coming out of the temple and they'd seen him earlier in the city with Trophimus. So by deduction, they figured he was with him at all times and gone to the temple, which had not been the case. But this shows you the seriousness of the situation. This stone was discovered in 1871, and, um, and it was under the Ottoman period, 
and so it was taken to the Istanbul Museum. And that's where you can see this entire stone today. Uh, here's the translation. Another partial fragment of this stone was found right in the same place near the Lion Gate, or St. Stephen's Gate, which is, as you know, close to the Temple Mount, not in the city of David. Long ways from that. And uh, so that gives indication that such an important stone would be found near the site of destruction. Here's another important stone. You can see this today, too. Josephus records that there was a corner of the Temple Mount, a point where it was custom for one of the priests to stand to give notice uh, uh, by the sound of a trumpet in the afternoon of the approach of the following evening at the close of every seventh day. That is, how did the people know when to stop working and start the Shabbat? They had someone, today they sound a siren, then they blew a trumpet. So Josephus tells us that. And they found right here a stone, and in it uh, there was this inscription. It says, to the place of trumpeting. And it was discovered at the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. Uh, it's, it's believed that this fits just what Josephus said, because it says, to the place of trumpeting on in, in Hebrew. Now the stone was detached from the other stone and taken and put in the museum. But you can see one in the museum and one still at the location. Now I've had people who follow the City of David theory that say, well, it was in the City of David and someone just drug it up to the Temple Mount. But here are pictures on the day it was discovered. And you can see where it fell right here. I, I came to Israel first in 78. It was still there. I was taken to see that. And here is a picture on the day of discovery by Arlene Rittmeyer back in 73 that shows it in situ, that is, in the place where it was found. So there's no question that it fell from up above where it was located in the southwestern corner. Also from the Temple Mount, they found uh, a sacrificial vessel, a korban vessel, which deals with sacrifice. And this was probably used uh, in the case of those who related to uh, maybe a sacrifice to celebrate the birth of a child or something like this. It has birds drawn on it, the Hebrew word korban, and this has to do with doves who were sold and bought in the temple. You remember in the story of the Jesus overturning the money changers' t uh, tables, it had these kind of birds mentioned. All right? So what is a sacrificial vessel like that doing in an Antonia Fortress? Romans don't do Jewish sacrifice with Hebrew letters on them. All right? We also found a sundial. Sundial are used by priests to determine the times for offerings, not for non-religious use. This would not be something that Romans would use up on the Temple Mount. Now, beyond that, there are temple-related artifacts from the Temple Mount Sifting Project. This has been going on for a period of 10 years. And let me explain that. Back in the, in the 1990s, um, the Muslims decided they were going to do their own thing. This was under Yasser Arafat. And they decided to come in and violate the status quo of the Temple Mount, and they brought in heavy equipment, and they just basically gutted the southern portion of the Temple Mount uh, where these gates were. You see the triple gate right before you there. And they were going to put a mosque, and they did. They built the al Mawani Mosque, which seats 10,000 people, right in this area. And in the midst of taking all this out, they took the debris and they dumped it. Uh, this is what's still dumped right on the Temple Mount below the eastern, uh, it's between the eastern gate and the Temple Mount itself. But they dumped uh, thousands and thousands of tons, up to 20,000 tons, of this archaeologically rich debris from the Temple Mount into the Kidron Valley and also into the Ariza, uh, Ariza garbage dump, which we can't retrieve. But archaeologists came, and you can see the places on the chart here where this material came from. And so for 10 years, they began to sift through this. I brought a team, for s spent three weeks sifting through this, uh, I'm holding a shell, a murex shell. This is the very shell that was used by the high priest. Uh, this is where the biblical blue comes from. This is how they dyed their garments. All the tzitzit that anybody wears that has the blue threads and with the white come from this particular shell. Why do we find lots and lots of those there? Because it was part of that industry. Romans didn't do that. This is part of a Jewish industry. Also found in the Temple Mount Sifting uh, Project were a type of stone, and Josephus tells us the entire open-air courts, this is probably the court of the women, were with stones of all colors and sorts. And they found these various types of stones, imported stones, 
called Opus Sectelli. And when it's put together, this is uh, Frankie Schneider who did this. She came up with the ways these floor tiles looked. And this fits again, Josephus' description of what the temple was like. And the Babylon Talmud says, who has never seen Herod's building, has never seen a beautiful building in his life. All right. Well, I, uh, there's a lot more evidence than this. And I haven't dealt with a lot of issues that some of you may be concerned with, but there just isn't time in this presentation. But let's talk about what we have learned. Uh, in English law, the citizen is required as being a free man of good repute. Issues may be raised in the civil action which affect the character and reputation. And these will not be forgotten by judges and juries when considering the probabilities in regard to whatever misconduct is alleged. So we have these different views. And, and these are put out by people, let's say, of good character with a good intention, okay, of explaining the Bible and making it clearer and possibly of giving evidence for things that support things in the Bible. So the intention is good. The question is, is the evidence good? Does it really support the claims they're making? The greater the claim, the greater the evidence has to be to support the claim. So if you're going to claim that the temple never stood here and in fact was somewhere else, you better have a good amount of evidence for it. And so they go on to say, there will be reluctance to rob any man of his good name. There will also be reluctance to make any man pay for what is not due or to make any man liable who is not or not liable who is. A court will not be deterred from a conclusion because of regret and its consequences. I can't stand here and say that I'm really sorry that I have to say someone else is wrong or someone else did not do good enough research. Okay, I, I, that, that can't be my concern because I'm trying to get to the truth of things, trying to get to the facts of things. It says, a court must arrive at such a conclusion as directed by the weight and preponderance of the evidence. And that's what I've tried to put forward today. We all have our sentimental reasons for believing things. We also uh, may have followed a certain person who does good work in one area, but may or may not, for one reason, have done proper research in another. This is not to discredit them or their whole work, but it is to say we're responsible for getting to the facts of things. I, I've, I'm very careful as an archaeologist, uh, even though I was uh, a biology major in college, I don't try to get involved in creation science debates. I teach a course on creation, and I, I, I do things in our creation science department. But I'm not, I, my PhD is not in that field. I don't try to get up and, and give people uh, clear verdicts on scientific things because I'm not trained in that area. I may know something about it, a whole lot about it. That doesn't mean I'm qualified to speak at that professional level on it. Now someone else, whatever their reputation may be in some other field, if their field is not archaeology, should not be dealing with professional interpretation of finds which require that background. This is not a matter of the Bible. It's a matter of a scientific investigation using scientific uh, techniques to understand what you're actually finding in the ground and then use the Bible as a means of comparison. And our whole goal always is the priority of Scripture. We believe the Bible. We don't need all this other stuff. But there's a skeptical world out there who questions whether we do good work, whether we really examine the evidence, whether we know what we're talking about. And that's why we have to do the best at everything we do because our, we're holding God's Word up and we're standing behind it and we're trying to get a testimony to it. So I want to be sure that we understand that. Finally, the reason is because God has chosen this place and he's going to return to this place. Zechariah 3 says, Thus says the Lord, I'll return to Zion, I'll dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. If it's going to be one day the city of truth, it ought to be true today. We ought to know the truth about it. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. It's not that now, but it will be one day then. Let me just say I have some resources to help you further with this. Uh, on our table, we have the Rose Guide to the Temple. Rose is the name of the publishing firm. I did this kind of coffee table book on the first, second temples and everything with all these illustrations to put this together for you. Um, I have something that's very unique. Uh, if you go today to Jerusalem and go to the Temple Mount, you cannot talk about the temple, as strange as that sounds. It's 
it's off limits to that kind of conversation. You cannot carry a Bible up there. You cannot wear a shirt with any kind of religious symbol on it. The Muslims go crazy over that, and you could be written up and, and banned from the site. We took three years. We took a crew over from Germany. Uh, we used 360-degree cameras. Uh, I got thrown off a lot of times. I got back on. Uh, but we went to every particular site of biblical significance in the Old and New Testaments, and we talked about the temple. We made these films there. And then we did this in 360. So this is a computer program. So if you couldn't tour the temple out properly when you're there, you can now do it on your own. And with your mouse, you can go anywhere you want to go. Jump over walls, go around things, and pull down menus, see the historical information. You can also see videos uh, talking about it on location. So I've done that. That's available. It also covers the tabernacle in Timna, so you can get a complete tour for the tabernacle on your own all, without all the heat, okay? All that stuff is there. Also have done a book called The Temple and Bible Prophecy. Uh, this connects all of the dots from the, the ancient past into the future. God has a program. He is unfolding. He's going to finish. This is a 750-page book. There's a lot about the temple in prophecy. Find out for yourself, all right? Um, I have also a handbook on archaeology, Zondervan did. We just did this the last year and a half. It's uh, got the most up-to-date information about all of these things, including the Temple Mount. And uh, a book that's been out for some time called The Stone's Crowd. It's an apologetic book, and it's designed to take the stories of the Bible, show you the evidence for them archaeologically, put it in the hands of an unbeliever. Last chapter says, where do the stones lead you? And it challenges someone to say, if we have this evidence, which really no other competing religions have for, them, for themselves, uh, then we should follow that evidence to faith. And that's what that's about. Uh, a new book came out just this fall called What Should We Think About Israel? This is written for younger people. Now, it's written for any age, but it was targeted for younger people who, in mass, have frankly uh, felt Israel's not important. They go to social media, they find out that it's an occupier, it's a colonialist, it uh, is involved with all kind of uh, uh, apartheid work. They hear nothing but bad things about Israel. So they don't really care about Israel. Uh, they even hear the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, sanction movement, tell them to stay away from Israel and products related to Israel. Um, and then uh, we have churches who don't teach about Israel at all, so it's kind of neglected, but Bible prophecy also is not taught, so they're distancing themselves from that. Anything related to Israel that might support it in terms of its uh, fight for survival or its spiritual uh, rebirth is simply being avoided. And this book targets every one of those questions. I have 20 different scholars from Israel, from among the Palestinians, from Europe, from America, writing very pivotal chapters that are aimed toward millennials and Generation Z. So this is a book you should read, you should give to your pastor, you should give to young people. And so uh, that's why we did this, to help counter media disinformation. Uh, if you want to follow some of the stuff I do, I write every issue for Israel My Glory magazine. That's a column called Unearthing the Truth with Randall Price, so you can find that. And then we have a ministry called World of the Bible Ministries, bringing the world of the Bible to the word of the church, worldofthebible.com. We have lots of other resources that you can find there. And uh, with that, we do tours as well, three tours a year. Okay, uh, Compass does that. Go with Compass first and foremost. Uh, but these are tours we've got coming up this year. You can find those all at the website. Well, let me just say thank you for giving attention to this. This is an important subject. It may seem like a pivotal, uh, I mean, a, a peripheral subject, but it's really a pivotal subject. And it's something we need to, to honor God with, with our minds, to know the truth so we can, uh, we says the truth will set us free, and free to share the truth with others and see a change in this world. You've been watching The Location of the Coming Jewish Temple, presented by Randall Price. To view more stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips, and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org.